Waiate Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union. Kia ora Aotearoa, welcome to Waiate Fifth Estate, where we wrap the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Joining us tonight to discuss if our justice system is racist or not, social policy analyst for the Salvation Army, Alan Johnson. On the phone, Irrangi Mako, Head of Restorative Justice for Manukau Urban Māori Authority. And on Skype from Wellington, Just Speak Chair, Chairperson Julia Farputi. Thank you for joining us, panel. And remember, viewers, you can send in questions and thoughts for tonight's show off the watianews.com and the dailyblog.nz platforms. Or you can email us on watia 5 e at watia603am.co.nz. Tonight's guest Twitter commentator is unionist Kate Davis. Follow her tonight using the hashtag watia 5th Estate. Let's get on with the show. News that four Northland teenage Pākehā were given lenient sentences of home detention for an $80,000 burglary spree has been met with fury online by many New Zealanders angrily claiming that if the four had been Māori or Pacific Island, they would have had the book thrown at them and be facing jail time. Is this fair criticism and what does such intense debate tell us about the real state of justice in, in, in Aotearoa? Why do you think people are so angry with the sentence? Oh, kia ora, Martin. Um, look, I think it's a... Um, people are so angry and... and mainly because I think it's around the sense of um, unfairness. Yep. Um, you know, they just... The media bombards us with uh, stories about Māori, young Māori males who have appeared in court, you know, um, what their sentences are. So when we finally get one in the media about non-Māori mm -hmm. who have appeared in court and committed a crime, um, it, it does appear that the sentence is, is sometimes less than what um, Māori, Māori or PI or, or people from low socioeconomic um, areas might get. Mm -hmm. So I think it really is around fairness and um, or the unfairness of it. And, 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 that's, and, and, you know, it's come at a time where we've had the story with Andrew Judd just come out with being a recovering racist. Um, there's a whole lot of other um, stories that are, that are affecting Māori right now at, at the moment too. So for those four young Pākehā boys, Yep. Uh, the story probably couldn't have hit at a worse time. Julia, what does it suggest about our current state of justice when so many Māori and Pacific Islanders believe the justice system is harsher upon them? I think that this is just um, evidence, further evidence to show that factually we actually know that the justice system has different outcomes for Māori and Pacific Islanders. We know that for the same crime, uh, a same offence, a Māori person is five times more likely to end up in jail than a non-Māori person. We know that statistically, and this is one of the first times that it's brought such a media, uh, been brought to the media spotlight, and it's and it's easily accepted by the general public. I told Toko Irirangi's uh, just then, and go and just take it further and saying that um, statistically. We know this already. It's evidence already. We have an inherently discriminatory um, justice system that treats Māori and Pacifica different to Pākehā, and this is this is a blinding, obvious proof of that. Uh, and I just want to go. I just want to cover one point and say that um, the issue shouldn't be that these these young men were let, let off a prison sentence because we know that prisons are a university for. Uh, for further and more serious offending. What the tuck here is, is when we have groups like Sensible Sentencing Trust and whatever, advocating for one law for all, I would ask, where is that one law for all, for Māori and Pacifica? Because there's clearly uh, different treatments that happen if you're Māori and if you're Pacifica. That's not okay. And we can talk more about why that, what the points of difference is and what the judge spoke about in his reasoning um, but if they were Māori or if they were Pacifica most certainly they would be in prison right now. Uh, Alan you, you, you work with the Salvation Army what's the knock-on in, in terms of the impact if young Māori and Pacific Islanders in poverty 
automatically believe the system mm. is against them? What's what's the knock on impact for them? For, in terms of an existential view of how they see society? Look, I'm not quite certain of that question because I'm not, not Māori or Pacific myself. And, but, you know, I think part of what, how that's manifest is, is basically this marginalisation, this alienation, this idea that the Pākehā society is for other people, not for me. Yep. Um, and then the sense of being outside that. And, of course, I think you get into a vicious cycle yeah. where the mainstream society reinforces that with its attitudes and behaviours, yep. and then the outcomes are reinforced. And so um, is it any wonder, particularly amongst Māori, but also amongst Pacific yeah. Islanders, that when you go to court, you expect the worst. Yeah. Um, you, you know, the whole system where, where basically uh, you're encouraged to plead guilty because you, 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 the level of representation you get from legal yes. aid is pretty yep. miserable. Yep, yep. And the reality is then is just a, a manifestation of a whole series of of problems for people subsequently when you know their sentencing doesn't isn't favourable towards them you know that the, the, the way that the, the offence is presented to the court and yeah. perhaps is unfair whole series of things works against you and and as Julia said Māori representation in prison is five five or six times that of nine Māori. Yep. So we're almost we almost have a, a a system set up of justice right now, which is exemplifying a kind of racist attitude towards anyone who's not white. I mean, how, how, how is it that we've gotten to a position where we just accept that as the norm now? We, we've, we've identified the excessive criminalisation of young Māori yep. in, in our State of the Nation report for yep. several years. Yep. And there's been deathly silence. No one has sought to explain that or to justify it. And the only politician, for example, that actually spoken up, up about it is Materia Ture. Yep. The Māori Party, for example, whilst, whilst they, they lament those things, effectively apologise for it because they're a, they're a coalition partner to the government. Yep. The police should be accountable for what they are and aren't doing, but mm -hmm. they simply remain silent. Edirangi, were you surprised by the depth of ill feeling amongst Māori and Pacific Islanders at the leniency and claims of double standards? No, no, of course not. I mean, my work in restorative justice, I, I see a lot of Māori and um, Pacific Islanders that come through the restorative justice process. And if I can just pick up on um, something that Alan just said there about the expectation, um, ex expecting, expecting the worst when you go to court, that's absolutely right. Um, it's a very disempowering process to be in there. And, you know, unless you have a lawyer who is going to care about you yeah. and really um, be able to articulate, I guess, what your bigger picture is, um, then you're not going to get fair representation and you, you, you will get a worse um, result or worse outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's, you know, it's that whole not being able to have your real voice heard there. Um, having said that, um, I, I wasn't at all surprised by the, um, the ill feeling, I guess, of the dismay that has been um, expressed on social media um, within my own family, within our own circles, around the, the sentencing that um, these young boys got. But, you know, they did go through restorative justice, but just a point about that is that that is a victim-focused process. Yeah. So it's not designed, restorative justice isn't designed to get offenders off anything. So um, that in itself, I mean, I have to give them props, those boys, for going through the restorative justice process because that yep. can actually sometimes be more confronting for um, the people who are appearing before court than Absolutely. actually being in court. Is there, is there a real problem, though, if we have that level of cynicism amongst some of our people mm -hmm. towards the justice, justice system, Urarangi, the, 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 just trying to get onto that, the knock-on effect is that people don't bother following the rules. If they don't see that the system is actually built for them, why should they bother complying with the norms? Isn't that a problem? Well, I guess there are plenty of um, organisations and whānau out there who are able to support our people who are finding it difficult, I guess, to follow the rules. Right. Or find themselves in a situation where they're appearing in court, and you know, for, for lots of us, lots of our organisations, and for people who are working on the ground, you know, we find solutions for these people, and we do it regardless of what the system puts in front of us or what hurdles the system make us jump. Um, 
we can find those solutions and, and, and we do find those solutions and we just do the mahi every day. Julia, isn't the point here that we actually do want lenient sentences handed out to young people because we don't want them in prison? Why is it that, that leniency, though, only ever seems to go one way when it comes to our justice system? Well, I think in this case, um, and I'm quoting Judge Harvey on this, he said, um, if it was not for the combination of support from their families and lawyers, they would, be, they would not be going to jail. What he's talking about there is the privilege of... Um, class mm. and also and with that all the other privileges that come with that with education with being surrounded with your whanau with that and we we know that uh, our Māori, Māori who, and Pacifica who are going through to graduating to prison it's it's usually an intergenerational poverty of class, of culture, of um, education. And so that kind of visual support that, that a Pākehā judge can understand and relate to, um, that only is really associated with Pākehā, that, that is applied. Uh, and I think that goes to an inherent injustice within our justice system. Because if we go back to colonisation, um, the consequences have flown from that that have alienated Māori from our land and mm. um, displaced Māori economically mm. and that's had flown effect, effects of education. Those are the mm. risk factors for, for offending yeah. and Māori are uh, disproportionately represented there as well and that flows on into prison and at the sentencing point which has happened with these Pākehā boys, uh, the judge could understand that because they had all of this support yep. that takes them out of the takes them out of a, a group that he understands to offend. I mean, he quoted they did they committed this level of offending not because they needed the money or or to fuel an addiction. They did it for the thrill of it. Yeah. Uh, in our system, but we should be encouraging these kinds of sentences. What the issue is, we're spending a hundred thousand dollars to put a Māori away every once every year through prison. If we took that putia and we invested it at the beginning, or said, okay, well maybe you don't come from this um, privilege of class, and you don't, you aren't connected culturally, or you don't have a, a whānau, you all of these issues are happening. If we took that money instead of holding our people in prison and invested into their community, their whānau, their day-to-day -day lives, we would have different outcomes. So we don't want to be sending people to prison, but we're clearly sending Māori to prison. Alan, uh, Julia's got a very, very, very strong point there, doesn't she? I mean, teen crime is linked with poverty. So are we completely out of touch here by not focusing on that as one of the drivers for crime in New Zealand? What's interesting about the recent crime data is that crime rates are falling. Yeah. You know, and there's yeah. some real strong evidence that crime rates are falling. And there's some real encouraging evidence around re re reducing offending amongst young people, Māori and non-Māori, which yeah. is really good news. And there's some, even some evidence that the police are becoming a bit more creative about how they respond right, to that. That's right, that's right. Yep. Albeit that they're not, re not as creative for Māori as they are for non-Māori. Yeah. But the reality is that we are planning for a prison population of 10,000 yes. prisoners yes. by the middle of next year. Yes. And so while we've got crime rates falling, the reality is we're locking and we're planning to lock up more and more people. Yeah. And as Julia has said, the majority of those, 56% of those are Māori and most of them will be young Māori. So the offenders that are going to fill those jails are probably 16, 17 and 18 year olds today. Yep. And we are doing this quite intentionally as a society without any problem whatsoever. Sociologist uh, 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 um, Jared Gilbert wrote a fascinating article looking at incarceration numbers for Māori recently. He described it as a national disgrace and that the levels of Māori the, uh, in terms of the percentage of the population and how much we are locking up is something that demands serious attention. Why is it politically we just can't do that in this country? Look, I think part of it's to do with the, the racism that the yep. Andrew Judd affair has yeah. unleashed and that there are large parts of New Zealand society that are still deeply racist towards yep. Māori. Yep. And I think that's only going to be something that dies out in terms of a generational attitude. Right, right. Um, but I think also that we've got a, a, a sort of a, the law and order lobby that whips up public fervour against yeah. um, more creative sentences for offenders, yep. which means, of course, then we have this mass... Um, desire to lock people up regardless of what the crimes are. Yeah. And I think that's part of the equation. Were you, just, just as a side uh, 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 issue here, were you surprised at the level of racism against Andrew Judd? 
when he came out and simply said that Māori should have some representation on the council. Look, I, I, look, I, I know very little about Taranaki. I live in South Auckland. South Auckland doesn't have those sort of attitudes. And so I was a little surprised that there was parts of New Zealand like that. But as I said, I don't know much about those sorts of communities. Uh, Irangi, Commissioner of Police Mike Bush last year on Watia Radio confessed that police do have an unconscious bias against Māori. Is this a police problem or a justice problem? Well, I think Alan actually hit the nail on the head before when he said it's a societal problem. And um, it actually just transfers through all of our, um, you know, through through everything, all, all of our systems, um, justice, justice system, uh, criminal health, you name it, it's through there. And I, I actually was, I grew up in Taranaki, so um, I wasn't surprised at the level of racism um, that came through for against Andrew Judge um, in, in that particular province. Um, I was disappointed that that's still there, so I think Alan's also right that we're going to have to wait to, um, for that to die out um, down there. But, yeah, I, look, in terms of um, an unconscious bias against Māori and police um, or justice, yeah, I think it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, we run a Malayan community justice panel, um, which is kind of like a pre-charge warning someone gets... Um, pulled over by the police or mm -hmm. found to be doing something and they come before our panel instead. So, you know, that's an initiative that um, we're working with on the police to try and keep people out of um, people out of the courts. Yep. And, you know, some of the solutions that we're finding is it, it's, it's not just that one incident, hey. There's a whole lot of issues that are going on for our people coming through that, through the court but also particularly through that and um, using the final order approach, we've been able to address some of those issues um, with not just that one person that's coming through the panel, but the whole whānau. Yep. And I think um, one of the ways we can start to combat this unconscious bias, however you want to dress it up, the racism, is we, we are needing to find solutions. Um, there's got to be an end and end thing. So, yep, policies and all of that need to change, but... We need to be working. We know what the solutions are to help um, overcome some of these issues, yep. and so I think we need to be we need to be able to do that and allow the space or, or create the space to do that for us as well, um, so that, that that unconscious bias or that racism, um, yep. yeah, the racism. I'm just going to call it that. I think, um, I think, I think you know, it's. <laughs> Calling it an unconscious yeah. bias is just a polite way of saying racism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, yeah, yeah. say, yeah, say yeah. what I mean, eh? Yeah. yeah. The racism. So, um, yeah, yeah. So that's why do you, why do you think, Irangi, why do you think we have such a thirst for imprisonment and incarceration in this country? It seems absolutely insane to me that we focus so much on locking people up rather than rehabilitating them. Um... Well, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's that feeling of loss of power. Yeah. Um, you know, the power, the people who have the power, are so, you know, they know what they know, and unless they're willing to try something else, they're just going to keep doing that. And yeah. we're just going to keep receiving the same messages from, um, you know, those institutions that can give out the messages. Like the media, for instance, telling yep. us that actually this is the way to go. We need to be incarcerating people and, and locking them up and throwing away the key, forgetting about what Alan says that next year we're going to be looking at 10,000 people released who have had not, none of that help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, it, it does seem incredibly counterproductive, doesn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, some of the cases that are in front of us at the moment in the media where you've got very violent people who have been released, they've done something uh, quite violent. Yeah. But if you actually have a look back at their history, they haven't been given any rehabilitation actually in the prison system. So how can we expect them to come out better if the incarceration, all it's done is damage them even further? Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right there. And um, I think Julia spoke about that earlier. Prevention is way better and trying to fix something um, after it's happened and, and, you know, by doing the same thing, by keep putting them in prison, um, you know, cutting the programs in prison that might actually give them a chance on the outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Julia, do, do we actually need to accept that bigotry in New Zealand is actually a lot bigger and a lot larger problem than we ever admit in public? 
Absolutely. I think it's an uncomfortable truth that the majority uh, of New Zealanders don't want to talk about or don't engage with uh, because they think it's an issue that's separate from them. Whereas everything that's in our criminal justice system is a reflection of the broader societal failures that we're all responsible for, but it's easy to label it a Māori problem or a criminal problem when that's not the case at all. 83% of prisoners under the age of 20 have been in civs care at one point or the other. We have a state intervention that puts uh, people on a conveyor belt into prison. Why are we invest? If we, if I'm trying to appeal to the Mike Hoskins of the world here, if we were looking at money as a taxpayer, we're investing money just to hold people in a place that costs us money as well. And then also uh, when they come out of prison, people who come out of prison are 30 percent of those people will reoffend within the next two years. That's a problem. We're paying for that as, as a country, and Māori are paying the price because every step within the criminal justice process, this isn't a matter of feelings or, you know, maybe this is happening. It's a fact. Statistically, a significantly, uh, a, a significant um, point of difference that Māori are treated different every step of the way, even without reducing um, uh, crime rate. Yep. So what's... Uh, police, props to them, they're the most active within the justice system and they're the front line, so they're the doorway and, well, the doorway is other things like education and all of that stuff, but they're the doorway straight into the justice system and they're the ones who have been most active in trying to address it. There's still there's still disproportionate treatment. Māori is still less likely to get diversion. Yep. Within Arangatahi stats, Māori, even though there's been a reduce in youth crime and youth prosecution, uh, the gap between Māori and non-Māori proportionately going being prosecuted has increased 20%, which oh, is unacceptable. Unbelievable. Do you think... We there is structural discrimination, racism. Yep. Do, do you... Where, where, place for me where you think private prisons come into this then, Julia, because if we're talking about motivation, if we have a government and a public service that says our motivation is to keep people who are damaged out of the community until they are safe and ready to go back into the community, that's one value. If you have a private prison, however, that says... All we care about is as many people inside the prison as possible because that's how we get paid. If you change the, 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 the incentives here, one for a corporation that is making profit and one for a government that's supposed to be looking after people, do you see the privatisation model actually going to be giving us worse outcomes? There is no place in this country or any country for privatisation model. There is no place to make a business out of people being in prison because it's not just those people, it's the whānau, it's the communities that they live in. There's no place to make money from this. We shouldn't be looking at making money. It costs us money. We need to invest that money to stop intergenerational... Uh, intergenerational offending, intergenerational poverty. We talk about taking three generations to break to, to break poverty on all levels, economic, cultural, spiritual. That privatization is the nothing. It's the opposite of that. Although I'll just say I'll just say that corrections, all those issues that came out with Circo over um, last year and that was publicized and the That's media right. was in, uh, those things those things aren't isolated to private uh, to private prisons. These are issues that are happening within our public system. The difference is the spotlight wasn't on there. And also, some of the, the contractual terms that Circo were obligated um, to meet, which was to reduce reoffending, they That's had right. actual targets to reduce offending for Māori to fight, to make sure that they have rehabilitated. Our current correction system has no uh, strategy to reduce Māori reoffending, to to uh, reduce reoffending altogether. There's no targeted Māori strategy, whereas at least Circo had it. But that's not the role, that is not the role of a private company, and there's no space for privatisation in this country. And yeah, our government needs to take responsibility for that. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Alan, the Prime Minister this week, and I don't want to laugh because it's, it's a bloody serious issue, but it just seems so deluded to me. The Prime Minister this week uh, said that people who are homeless should go to WINS. Are we as out of touch on the incarceration and the impact of poverty on incarceration? Are we as out of touch there as the Prime Minister is on poverty? Look, I expect the Prime Minister knew exactly what he was doing. I think he knows what wins is like to the people who, who have to 
um, use the services of WINS. Mm -hmm. um, but he was trying to project an image of WINS being this benevolent, helpful organisation yeah. to middle New Zealand who has nothing to do with WINS until they want to sign up for the superannuation. Yep. So I think it was a, m a deliberate misrepresentation rather than a mistake about the reality of how things are. Do you think that we also do the same game when it comes to incarceration? There are certain myths that we need to believe, aren't there? Look, I don't, I don't know. I don't imagine that most New Zealanders can understand what it's like to be in prison. Mm. I can't. Mm. Um, and I think part of the, 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 the way it's framed is much earlier on than that, where we have to have somebody who is seen as, as the other, the, the, the yeah. person on the outside, the group that we should fear. Yep. Yep. And I, I, I believe many in the law and order lobby, and in fact many people in parliament have created that fear. Yep. And even as we see crime rates falling, we still have this emphasis on these heinous crimes as being representative of everyday life, and we know they just aren't. Uh, we have to wrap the show. Before we go, we'll do a quick final word with our panellists. What changes need to be made to our just, justice system right now? Urdurangi, what changes? Oh, look, there certainly needs to be um, more emphasis on um, before people get to the stage of getting into court. And I, maybe that sits with the justice system, maybe it doesn't. But it, certainly we see um, in our line of work that if we, can, if we can reach people before it gets to that stage, it certainly makes a huge difference to uh, how far no function for the rest, I guess, forever after that. Julia, what do we need to do? We need to invest the money that we're using to hold people in jail. We need to reinvest that at the beginning. Um, so that's prevention, but also in, at our justice, when people are entering the justice system, we need to be investing in rehabilitation and education and opportunities to create hope for these people coming out because they're coming back into our communities so that they don't come back and cost us more money. And that's just the start. Alan? I agree with Julia. I think that the real issue is about how ineffective our rehabilitation programs yeah, are. Yeah. And I actually think we un have to understand that rehabilitation and reintegration happens outside of prison. Yeah. And we actually have to make certain that the environment that prisoners move back into is supportive of them not to reoffend. Uh, thank you, panel. And to my final word, we should not be outraged that four Pākehā teenagers were given a lenient sentence. We should be outraged that leniency isn't handed out to every teenager. Teen brains have not developed frontal lobes where decision making and consequences of actions are reasoned out. So demanding from them a level of adult culpability that they are biologically unable to live up to seems akin to demanding table manners from infants. It should concern us though that so many young Māori and Pacific Islanders believe the justice system is biased against them. Not because that's a false impression, but because sadly, it is far too often the truth. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, whānau, for watching. We'll join you again tomorrow night, 7pm, for Wātea Fifth Estate. Kia ora and good night. Wātea Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union.